Okay. To to try to just summarize this, I I took all the important equations and formulas from the textbook and put them here. So it looks a little bit different from the way we've been doing it. We've been dealing with it. Uh, but see if you could just match it all up. It's all kind of like the same. <clears throat> so the first formula is a line in vector form. And it has a point and a direction where we've been calling our direction vector D for direction. Here they call it V for vector. But it's generally the same. And I, I've been calling my point PT or P. And here they just call it R0. So it's the same sort of deal. You just one of them is just a point, one of them is a direction that the vector that the line is going. And so uh, the, the point that they're giving here, R0, is an x0, y0, z0, if we want to look at it per component. And then the vector v that they give here looks like it's uh, a, b, and c. So by taking that vector form and expanding it out into the different components, you have the parametric form. of the line. And the parametric form of the line has as many equations as there are dimensions. So in 3D, you'll have three equations, one for the x, one for the y, one for the z. <clears throat> and then if you solve for t for all of these and set them all equal to each other, you will have the symmetric form. Of the line. I'm really more concerned about you being able to write the, the vector and the parametric form of the line. Uh, symmetric form is not too important. <clears throat> and here they have another formula for the line segment in vector form. And this is a, a formula that they gave you, I think, in, the, in chapter 10. It's, it, maybe it wasn't written like this because we didn't know about vectors so much back in chapter 10, but it's, it's essentially the same formula. <clears throat> All right, uh, the right-hand side of this page The right-hand side of this page gives equations for the planes. These are vector forms of the plane, vector forms of the equations of the plane. I, I don't think they're that important, but uh, what is good to point out is that uh, your, your R here without the not are your variables x, y, and z, the r vector. And the r naught vector is your points, is the specific point x naught, y naught, z naught. <clears throat> and that is the point on the plane. It's a, Oh, it should be, uh, it should be plus, we usually look at it as plus, because um, it's not, um, it's the normal vector, but we don't always assume that the normal vector comes from the cross product, and so we don't, all, the only time we think about the, the J being negative is when we're actually physically taking the cross product.
Yeah. So the normal vector, when you plug it into these sort of equations uh, and formulas, they could either be in either direction, right? Like it matter? No, it doesn't matter, because if it's going one direction, um, then your signs will be positive or negative or whatever, but then when you dot it on the other side, you're going to get the same same signs so that you can easily eliminate on both sides of the equation. <clears throat> so I think the, the vector form of the equation of the plane is not that important, but it is important in the sense that this is how we can play around with all these pieces of information. Like uh, the second form, the second vector form over here, if you were to do the dot product between A, B, C, and X, Y, Z, you're going to get A, B, C, or A, X, plus B, Y, plus C, Z. And the only thing that we conventionally do in our class, or when I, when I teach it, when I do it, it's the D is on the right-hand side. So here the D is on the left-hand side. So if you're trying to follow their notes and my notes, there's a negative sign compensation thing happening there. But it's not that big of a deal. I like the D on the right-hand side because we can look at this vector form of the equation and the N dotted with a point R is going to be that D value that we've been calling our D value. It's easier to identify that way. Those R's are points. You can think about them as points, but remember that points can be vectors from uh, in standard position pointing to that point. It's, it's the same thing. So that's why I, I'm kind of, sometimes I make my vectors as points, sometimes I make my vectors with those, with the vector thing. But what do you call these things? These <laughs> vector notation? Yeah. <clears throat> so I think, yeah. Sorry, so then for that technically should be vector notation, but again, I, I kind of want to be flexible in calling my vectors as points and points as vectors. All right, so I think I would um, want you to just remember that our equation of the plane has uh, the, the components of the normal vector as the coefficients of x, y, and z, right? That normal a, b, c has the same x, y, z uh, coefficients. And then you just need to figure out your d. And then that d is based on this dot product with a normal and some random point on the plane. And regardless of what point you choose, it should be the same d if you're talking about the same plane. Yeah? So all of these the, yeah, the, all these things, all these four things are the same. All these four things up here are the same. Okay. Or, e, or even this one is it's part of the same kind of business. But there's just ways to explore, express lines and planes. Okay? They're just different forms, you know, uh, vector, parametric, and symmetric forms. And here we have a vector form, and in, in the, they call this a scalar form of the line. So. All right. Uh, the other thing that was highlighted in this in this section was distances, and we talked about the distance between two parallel planes, and that's this distance over here. The distance between these two parallel planes. What we didn't do is this distance between a point and a plane. And uh, I don't want to go through the whole derivation of this thing, but uh, it's the same idea that we had for the distance of uh, two planes. And what you would do is you would pick an arbitrary point on the plane, any point on the plane, and then you would 
draw a vector. I guess it doesn't matter which way the vector is going. <coughs> and then you would have you would take your normal vector. And then you would find the projection of this vector <coughs> onto the normal. And that's the same way we did the equation of the plane. And so when you do that projection, you're going to end up with this formula. Again, our, our, uh, the way we write our equation of the plane, we have the d on the right-hand side. And so I think there might be a negative sign here instead of a positive sign if you follow our notation versus the book's notation. <clears throat> okay, so that's a summary. Once you have the distance between a point and a plane, then this actually, this distance between two parallel planes would just follow, and then you can find a distance from any point to any plane. Like if you had two skew lines, you can follow the same, same sort of procedure. Okay, so look through our notes and look through the book, the book's explanation for the point in the plane, and then you can hopefully piece things together. All right, <clears throat> um, Jessica wanted to take a look at a problem from 12.5. <laughs> You guys are familiar? Oh, she's not here. <laughs> All right, well, let's see if we can figure this out. Um, here they're telling us that the lines are skew, so we don't have to go through a process to prove that they are skew. But if you want to show that two lines are skew, you would probably want to uh, try to find the intersection between them, and if you can't find the intersection, you have to assume that they're skew. Oh, also provided that they're not parallel. So let's take a look at these two skew lines in space. And uh, I don't know if you, I convinced you last time, but I said last time I said if you have uh, if you have two lines that are skew, you can always find two planes that are parallel that each line lies on. So, so for example, this line that I just changed into green color would lie on this particular plane and then the other line that's below it would lie onto another plane and they're both parallel which means they both would have the same normal or at least you can say that the normal is both going in the same direction so <coughs> we can assume that line one Uh, is x is equal to 1 plus t, y is equal to 3 plus 6t, and z is equal to, I'm going to put the 2t over here so it'll be painfully obvious that my point is 1, 3, 0, and my direction vector for this is 1, 6, 2. So I have a point, 1, 3, 0, and a vector moving along that line, 1, 6, 2, that is on the plane. All right, so now line 2.
would be your equation 3 plus 2s y is equal to 6 plus 14s and z is equal to minus 2 plus 5 s so I have a point on that plane it's on that line but then it's also on the other plane 3, 6, negative 2 and I have the direction vector for this line to be on that plane 2, 14, 5 Okay, so if I want the distance between these two skew lines, I'm essentially wanting to find the distance between these two planes. We can go through and find the equations of the planes and use that formula, or we can just find the equation of one plane and then find a, di find a distance between a point and a plane. So either way would work. Uh, it's not much more work to find the equations of both planes because I think it's just as easy. But we do need an equation of at least one of the planes. And for that, we need an equation of a plane. We need two things. What do we need? Point and a normal vector. So for a plane, you need a point and a normal. So depending on which plane we're going to use, we can, we can just use whatever point for the plane. But we do need a normal vector. So what's interesting about this is that the direction um, for the second plane and the direction for the first plane oh what happened there it goes let's try that again what <laughs> I want that and remember these are vectors right so the vectors can be moved around and so if you take those two vectors and put them tail to tail for visual purposes only because you don't really care but to try to visualize this uh, you, if you take those two vectors <laughs> and you cross them you're going to get a vector that's perpendicular to both of those two vectors which is going to be <laughs> which is going to be our normal vector so that's what we'll do we'll just cross uh, these two direction vectors to get our normal and then we have a normal vector and then we can decide from there what to do with it. Yeah, because they're parallel, they're, their normals have to be going in the same direction. So our normal vector is going to be D1 cross D2, um, 1, 6, 2, and it doesn't matter what the order is because whether it's going up or going down, it's still a normal vector. It's, it's going to work fine. So in the I direction, uh, I have 30 minus 28 is 2. In my J direction, I have negative, and then a 5 minus 4, negative 1. And in my K direction, I have 14 minus 12, 2. So that's my normal vector. Is that, is that right? Okay. <coughs> so now that I have my normal vector, we can find the equation of one of the planes or whatever. Um, I suppose we'll, it's just as easy to find both of them, right? So. Let's 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 find the equation of this plane right here. 
So the equation of the plane is simply going to be the normal vector as coefficients of the x, y, and z. So that's 2x minus 1y plus 2z is equal to, and now we want to take the dot product of the normal and the point, right? And so that was, that was from this business over here. A dot product of the normal and the point. So the dot product of the normal and the point, 2 minus 1, 2, dotted with 3, 6, negative 2. And that's going to give me whatever it's going to give me. 6, 0, negative 4? Confirm? Yeah? So this is your D for this. And uh, we can do the same thing to find the equation of this plane, or we can just uh, use the, this formula for the point distance between a point and a plane. Right? Let's use this formula to find the distance between a point and a plane. So to use that formula to find a point and a plane, um, the distance is going to be do you guys have the formula memorized already? Yeah, that's between two planes. So we're technically, I want the point in the plane, but... You have the x's multiplied, the y's multiplied, and the z's multiplied plus z's. Yeah. So if you look really closely, you have a, b, c, which is a normal vector. And then you have x1, y1, and z1, which is the point. Right? So... You have the normal vector, 2 minus 1, 2. You're going to multiply that with a point, 1, 3, and 0. Right? Minus negative 4. That's your D. Uh, yeah, so so this is this is where I was uh, talking about this plus over here. Um, if it was written, your your equation for the plane is written as a x plus b y plus c z plus d equals zero. That's the equation of the plane. So if you bring that d to the other side, it's really a negative d or a minus d. Okay? If you want to bring it back over and follow theirs, or you can do either way. <clears throat> and they want the magnitude of that, and then they want the, the magnitude. Absolute value of that, and then they want... Man. Well, you could, you, this point, well, that means, but then you have to have the plane for line one. You have to have the green plane. You have to get the D from the green plane. Okay? So before we go on and finish this, we're almost done, I want you to look at, at this at this uh, expression uh, on the in the on the absolute value the first part of the expression where they say ax1 plus by1 plus cz1 and you're looking at it so that's the normal dotted with a point on the plane 
what is this? Aaron, <laughs> he already said it. it oh, we, oh, Brian, what's up? It's what? It's D for the first plane. So this is actually D1. Had we found the equation of this plane, this is a computation we would have done to find D1. And then this, we'll call this D2. So it's the same thing, is what I'm trying to say. All right, so you guys can finish this. You get a number, and then you put, put it in your whatever. OK, is this good? All right, because we need to go. We need to move on to what we're going to talk about today. I mean, move on. <laughs> Okay, so today's section is uh, section uh, no twelve six section twelve six, which is uh, looking at three dimensional surfaces in uh, in in sort of a conic way of looking at it. <laughs> what? All right, let's start off this way. In uh, three dimensions, no, let's start off with two dimensions. So, x squared plus y squared is equal to one is what? It's a circle. So if I were to draw this on the xy plane, I would get a circle, right? That's exciting. So now, if I say I live in three dimensions and I give you the equation x squared plus y squared is equal to 1, what's that say about z? Well, I didn't say z was 0. I just said I have an equation x squared plus y squared is equal to 1. What can you say about z? z is what? z is infinite. It's valid for all values of C. Z. 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 So, what that means in three dimensions is that if I were to bring this up to three dimensions, x squared plus y squared is equal to 1 would be, if I were to view it on the xy plane like I drew it in two dimensions, I would see this circle on the xy plane. All right? Now, when you say z is infinite, or what was the, uh, who, 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 z is what? Valid for, all z. Valid for all z. So z is equal to 0 was the first guess, which was not quite correct. But if z was equal to 0, if I say x squared plus y squared is equal to 1 and z is equal to 0, then this is all I would have, is that, is that circle on the xy plane. But if this is valid for any z value I, I have, when z is equal to 1, I would have the same circle, but it was up a little bit of height 1. And if I had z is equal to 2, I would have the same circle that's up a level of 2, right? And if I say z is equal to negative 1, I would have that same circle down below. So can you picture this? What do we have? Cylinder. We have a cylinder. This is an open circle, nothing inside. It's just a circle that's being swept up and down. So it turns out that x squared plus y squared is equal to 1 is a cylinder where infinite z, there's no restrictions on the z, so this is just an infinite cylinder that goes on forever. Okay? It's not a circle anymore. <laughs> so,
So we call this a cylinder. Let's start being a little bit more formal. Uh, instead of just calling it just a plain cylinder, let's call this a circular cylinder. That's not very exciting. <laughs> What other kinds of cylinders are there? That's a good question. Let's explore that question. Let's, let's take this other function, or not function, let's call it a, a relation between x, y, and z in three dimensions where I have z is equal to sine x. z is equal to sine x. Now imagine this, right? There's no, uh, there's no y's, so uh, there's only two variables, so potentially I can draw this in two dimensions. And so the two dimensions that I would be looking at would be something that would be on the xz plane. So let's try to visualize this on the xz plane. And this is sine z. So sine z, it goes through the origin, and it has a period of 2 pi or whatever. But technically, it goes on forever <coughs> along the x. OK? Now again, let's bring this to three dimensions. Where it was well defined and drawn on the xz plane. Let's see, let's try to attempt to draw this on the xz plane. This positive part over here would be going along the x-axis. All right, so it, if you could try to draw it uh, as, as uh, close to being slanted as possible, I have my height at 1, and the low height, the low, uh, the low part is at negative 1, so it doesn't go past that. <clears throat> Anyways, we'll start off with that. And if we play the same game we did with the cylinder and say, okay, well, for the x squared plus y squared is equal to 1, it doesn't matter what z was, but you can change the value of z and you would get the same picture of the circle. So here I have a sine curve with no y's, so maybe it doesn't matter what the values of y are, I'm still going to get the same sort of sine curve, right? So if we could just imagine the sine curve... That wave, that sine curve wave and then drawing it along the y-axis. It's a little tougher to picture, but maybe I should have done a parabola. But, <laughs> but really, this is all connected. You can think about connecting all these things. So. Uh, if you want, we can just look at this sheet. And it would be something like this. It would just be a sine wave that's being swept up along the y-axis. Okay, so this too is called a cylinder. <laughs> Remember when you guys were in high school and then somebody told you that an asymptote, asymptote was one of those lines that you can never touch? Right? And then you came to college and then realized that that was a wrong 
that was a wrong definition. <laughs> so, for example, we have y equals 1 over x times sine x or something like that. Uh, the asymptote is zero, but this graph is going to hit zero an infinite number of times, right? So that definition when they say, oh, the asymptote is a line that you're never going to hit was wrong. Somebody lied to you, okay? <laughs> so when somebody said this is a cylinder and these are the only cylinders we have, they're lying. <laughs> A cylinder is any shape that can be drawn in two dimensions and swept along a third dimension, and then you're going to get that same shape. Are you okay with that? Your mind is free now. <laughs> I forgot what I said. What did I say? It's a two-dimensional shape that could be swept across the third dimension. It's a cylinder. Um, I should have done a parabola because I would call it a parabolic cylinder. This one has a sine wave, so I'd probably call it a sine wave cylinder. <laughs> I might be lying to you. You'll find out when you get to grad school. <laughs> I remember where you like, I just opened your mind, and then I might be like, <laughs> 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 at least your mind's open. <laughs> <laughs> so, a cylinder a surface consists of all lines, including rulings that are parallel to a given line passing through. So, if you like that definition better, you can copy the book. But I like my definition better, whatever it was I said. So that means the cylinders, circular cylinders, or if we made it into an ellipse, for example, elliptical cylinder, uh, are, are just equations that you can write in two dimensions and then extend it and sweep it across the third dimension. So a graphing calculator program like this one is nice in that I can just type in a relationship between x, y, and z, and then uh, try to see what the graph is going to look like. So, for example, let's do an elliptical cylinder sweeping along the x-axis. So I want to write a, an ellipse in y and z. So let's see. Um, y squared divided by 4 plus uh, z squared divided by 9 is equal to 1. So if we look at this, this is an ellipse. It's going to cross the y-axis of plus and minus 2. It's going to cross the z-axis of plus and minus 3. But if I were to draw this in, in three dimensions and zoom out enough, I would get that ellipse. If I'm looking at it dead on from, from the x-axis, so the only axis that I see here are the y and z axis. Uh, but if I look at it from another point of view, then it's actually that cylinder that's being swept. Okay, that other one that we just did, z is equal to sine x. That's that wavy one. Uh, polar coordinates are a little bit trickier to, to do. Like if I move out, yeah. yeah. And and what this is doing is just uh, the the graphing program is just limited to whatever your window is. Here, a window is right now negative eight to eight, but you can certainly zoom out more if you want to to get more of a picture that you need. Like if I want to keep this, I want to see a bigger, you know, because as you go out, 
the negative one to one restriction on the z gets flat. So if I want to go from negative two to two on the z, I can see a little bit wavier. Okay, so that's a cylinder. All right, now beyond cylinders, because at this point the cylinder, cylinders are the easiest things to deal with, beyond cylinders are kind of like the conic sections, but in, in three dimensions they call it a cortex. Wait, quadrix. <laughs> oh, what happened? I lost it. Quadrix, <laughs> cortex. Just making it up now. <clears throat> so they define a quadric surface to be something complicated, and I, I don't, I don't want, you know, I don't want you to to worry your pretty little head <laughs> with that funky equation. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll break it up into the different, kind of like the conic sections, we'll break it up to the different surfaces that we're going to study. All right, we'll start off with a sphere. And you know the, <clears throat> you know the equation of a circle to be x squared plus y squared is equal to 1. Now imagine just extending that to another dimension. And if I kept it as x squared plus y squared is equal to 1, and I say I want to be in three dimensions, you know that's going to be a cylinder, right? So if I want to close that off and make it look like a sphere, quad, quadric, quadric, quadric. <laughs> so let's start off with a sphere, uh, x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to r squared is going to be your sphere. Okay, Just like the circle, except we're going to go into another dimension. So we'll take your z, and then you'll, you'll square it, and then make it an r squared. And just to be sure about that, we should do a quick graph of it. Um, x squared plus y squared plus z squared uh, is equal to, let's go 9, so we'll see a radius of 3, and that's your sphere, okay? <clears throat> now, the difference between a circle and an ellipse is that uh, the, the coefficients for the x squared and y squared or z squared are not all the same. So if I have a 2 x squared and uh, something else y squared and then something different z squared is equal to something else, then I'll have an ellipse. So if I, if I for example, a three-dimensional ellipse. So if I imagine I, if I take this and multiply it by 2, then I don't know if you can tell, but it got stretched out a little bit. I guess let's exaggerate this, multiply this by 9. It's like a red blood cell. There, now it's red blood cell. <laughs> Except it's kind of in indented on the inside, right? Yeah. Oh, that's a good that's a good project question. Make a make a red blood cell surface. Yeah. <laughs> We're not doing projects. So in any case, to make this kind of uniform or to make it look like the equations that we had back in two dimensions, what we can do is uh, we can uh, write it as x squared over a squared. Because you divide everything by the right-hand side so that it's just one on the right-hand side, right? And so all these things will just um, get divided out. And assuming you have different coefficients here, a, b, and c, then it's not a sphere. So, <clears throat> all 
So this is called an ellipsoid. It's an ellipse in three dimensions. Uh, what else did we have in, in the conic sections? We had uh, sphere, ellipse, hyperbola, and parabola. <clears throat> Let's do the easy one first. Now, uh, I'm going to write z is equal to x squared plus y squared, but uh, any combination of these things or any of these switches could also occur. But uh, something like this would be an easy, it's like saying y is equal to x squared is your parabola. Uh, z is equal to x squared plus y squared is your standard paraboloid. So when we're talking about the focus points for the parabola and then the dish as an example of, of the focus point, the dish is three-dimensional. So really, when we're talking about a dish, we're talking about a paraboloid. You can think about it as a parabola that's being spun around to make a paraboloid, but it's really a paraboloid. Okay? Is the center of that open answer? Yes, there's a hole. There's a set, it holds water. Yeah. The focus of well in the center in there somewhere. Yeah. Okay. So the thing about this is that these paraboloids uh, are not restricted to paraboloids opening up and down like we have here. This could be a sideways paraboloid. For example, if you have x is equal to uh, y squared plus plus z squared. This is a paraboloid that's pointing sideways. And I'll, I'll talk about why the paraboloid, paraboloid looks like this. But it's, it's opening sideways. Yeah? And then one more, x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared minus z squared over c squared is equal to 1. This is a hyperboloid. Now, depending on this combination of pluses and minuses, this hyperboloid can either look like a silo or it could look like a hyperboloid of two pieces. So we have to further categorize this. We don't have too much time anymore. But this is a one sheet hyperboloid, hyperboloid of one sheet. This is a hyperboloid. with two sheets. Okay? And so the, the distinction between them is that one of them has two negative signs or something. The other one only has one negative sign or some combination of that kind of stuff where you can have one or two sheets. All right? So next time we'll, we'll dive into more of these things and make distinctions based on uh, how the how the function, how the relationship, the equation looks like. We should be able to tell if this is an ellipsoid, a hyperboloid, one or two sheets, paraboloid, or a sphere. All right. See you guys next time. <laughs>